Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today is November the 14th, and we are back on Strat Chat talking about build orders. Hello, Hello guys. What's up? Today we have a, uh, have a Nebula theme for extra pictures. I, that's fairly nebulous. If you can identify them, it'd be great. It'd be pretty easy to identify, I think. Ooh, those are good pictures. Let me see. I want to see. Maybe I can open the stream. And be yeah, I'm opening it. And before it becomes <laughs> an episode on astronomy, and it just talk about. Stuff. I would be two he <laughs> two people here are astrophysics um interested people. One of which is pursuing a PhD. Uh, so master's. I would be I would be or master's not PhD. Okay, fine. I'm sorry. You should pursue the PhD. Yeah, I, I sent my I sent my application to an institute two days ago. So hopefully next year. So I would be, I would be, I would, I would be okay about making the entire episode about um, astronomy. In fact, we could, we could, we could discuss NASA's build order to get to Mars. Um, <laughs> but... By the way, uh, I recognize the nebula on the right, not the one on the left. Okay. Which one is it, Teo? It's the Crab Nebula, I think. That's right. Yeah, that's correct. It's the Crab. Mm -hmm. That one's pretty recognizable, I think. Yeah. And the one on the left is uh, Eta Carina. Oh, is it? it? Is? I... Yep. And which filter is it? It doesn't look like it. That doesn't. I no, I did, wouldn't ever sure. have guessed that. Be sure that's where I got it. Yeah. All right. Oh well. So, for everyone here who's not interested in nebulas, <laughs> um, which is a shitty term, by the way. Yeah, it's the Eterina nebula. Yep. Yep. So, for everyone here who's came for the build orders, uh, today we'll <laughs> be talking about um, what a build order is, um, why they matter. The influence of maps and yep, um, oh. the uh, <laughs> sorry, I got cut out there for a second. Uh, the influence <laughs> of maps on the build orders, um, how you execute wow. them properly, creating your old um, and copying existing build orders, um, and we will talk a bit about the existing build orders that we know of in Legacy of the Void, um, with the understanding, of course, that the game had literally just came out a couple of days ago. And there hasn't been, a, even with the beta going on, with things changing constantly, there hasn't been a lot of time for solid ones to really develop. But we have we have some pretty good ideas as to what they should look like, um, and we have some basic ones to go over. So we'll be doing that as well. So, Teo, lead us off. What the hell is a build order? Uh, I think the simplest thing to do is a list of things to do in a specific order, and the goal of that is to achieve something either a bunch of units or an extra expansion or whatever in the most efficient way possible. That's my definition. Or in a way that is reason not necessarily the most efficient way possible, but in a way that fits your strategy, I should say. Okay. Chris? Yeah, I'm I'm definitely agree with that. I had a talk with Vader Seven a long time ago, uh, where he Fair. basically just said to me, um, a lot of people have this misconception that build orders are strategies, but rather they're actually just tools to achieve a strategy. So it's it's kind of a I guess like an optimization of early game build up in order to get you to strategy that you want to achieve. That's how it's I think build orders. It's not necessarily early. I'd say it's early and mid game, depending on how you define a build order. Yeah, well, I mean, but, it's 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 basically it's what takes you from having um, twelve workers and a base to having you know units and an army and stuff later in the game. So yeah, personally, I always divided in my mind build orders in two categories. One being the opening, which to me was defined by specific food counts when I would get when I get things, just because of when I play. And the other is the mid game, which is defined by timings when I do stuff. So timings when I get my upgrades or when I move out or whatever. Okay, yeah, more or less. So why don't we? So yeah, so let's let's fix the definition. So you said you said a word I was hoping for. Um, opening. Um, a build order to me basically is your opening. So if you think about other games like chess, you it, the equivalent to a build order there would just be doing an opening like Sicilian or any of the other numerous openings that exist. Um, so the, the, the basic just is just how you start the game off. What you're, you have to need a strategy of some coin or plan going into the game if you want to play well. 
and your build order is essentially the method at which you attempt to put yourself in the best position to follow through and execute on the strategy that you have planned. Uh, you would, right? More or less? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, right. but I, I wouldn't say a, a build order is necessarily only an opening. Like, as I said, I think of it as something that goes on after the opening as well, personally. So right, well, well, we'll discuss that a little. We'll get into that. Um, we'll we'll get into yeah. that in a minute, I guess. Um, so just to just for anyone who's new and watching this, um, new to StarCraft, because I know with Legacy coming out, we might have um, a bunch of new people coming to the game who haven't been here before, maybe don't know. Um, why don't we discuss how build orders are denoted um, and explained or described in general? Because um, I know when I first started playing StarCraft, um, I looked down and saw six pool, and had literally no idea what that meant. Um, and I actually thought for a minute that it meant building six spawning pools before I actually said that and went, wait a sec, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so build orders in general, um, as they're typically described, are explained in terms of the supply at which you have uh, when the building or unit or whatever it is that you're building is produced. Um, and it's, it's a way of doing it rather than giving very specific times for doing things. We could do it with num with actual literal clock denotations with a, with a timer. Um, although I guess it's mostly a holdover from Brood War in which they didn't have an in-game clock. Um, depend uh, in like, way. It's not just that. It's Early on, it's really easy to just follow the supply count for when you do stuff because nothing's mm -hmm. happened. Later on, you could have maybe had to sacrifice a couple workers instead of one to scout, or maybe there was a skirmish and you lost a couple of units or whatever. So it's much harder to go by food counts. So we so, use food counts early because it's easy. Yeah, and later on, I always found it more easy and more intuitive to just go with timers. And if, if not with timers, another way to use your build order, yeah, to look at your build orders is when you have your economy. So, for example, you could say something as, as soon as you have perfect to base saturation, which you can see, you start thing X, you start your third base or whatever. Right. So I there's think, different ways of counting. Um, food, count, food counts is the simplest earlier on. I think later on, because food counts don't take into account what actually happens in a game, there are better methods, like timings or economy. Yeah. Uh, or more actually or less. Okay. having units... Like, um, a typical thing again in Protoss against Terran is you get Storm at a certain Colossus count in Heart of the Swarm. Right. Yeah, Which, I think... since we don't build Colossus anymore, that won't have a repetition. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I tend to think of it in, in basically, like, three different terms. Like, you have food counts, you also have timings and stuff that can be used either later on in the game or uh, timings to get your gases and things like that. Um, and then also just in terms of relative things. Um, so when X finishes, build this, yeah. or at, at when you have the X many units, then you build this, et cetera, et cetera. So those, those kind of three things, I think, all combine to make one thing. Right. Build so order. Basically, a build order, as it's typically explained, will just be a list of things that you build with a number associated with it, like nine pylon in Heart of the Swarm, or I guess 13 pylon now. Um, or I guess like, what is it? 13 overlord. Um, so that just, that just means at what supply you will be at, assuming that you are consistently making workers. Um, if the build order wants you to cut workers at a specific time for whatever reason, it'll, the person who created the build order will say cut workers at this supply or so on and so forth. Um, so the, the numbers are bad at writing guides, right? Right. Unless he's just bad at build orders, but, um, <laughs> The, the, a well a well written build order will just get, will assume typically that you are con making continuous worker production, um, and that's what you base your su the supply count off, and that tells you when to start building stuff. And if you're doing the build orders right and following it, the the money should align correctly so that you can build things on time and appropriately. There are little tricks you can do like stacking workers on close mineral patches to make speed things up a little bit, and some build orders will actually require you to do that in order to get things done at time. I know I used to play, when I played Protoss exclusively, a Phoenix build in PvP that actually required you to stack workers on minerals in order to be able to afford your pylon on time to not get supply blocked. Also um, scouting times. That's, I think, much bigger than stacking workers. 
like when you send a scout right after pylon on your first pylon or your first gate or your cyber core after yep. a bit when you have when you just have non-stop early game production and you have builds that line up you can feel a massive difference yep if you scout too early you can't do your build if you scout too late well you did your build have extra money and you didn't get the information you might have needed yeah so all right um so that's that's basically just how we explain build orders now Teo, why does having a good build order matter? Um, I don't think it matters that much actually for the average player. As in, by good you mean efficient. It just needs to be something you're confident in. Because you just feel comfortable playing instead of just being like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. If you have a build, even if it's not very good, and this is... Something I used to give shit to my teammates all the time because they had the worst fucking build orders ever. But they would play even better than me because they trusted those builds. It's important because you know what you're supposed to do against the variety of things your opponent can throw at you. So as soon as you spot something, you're like, aha, I know how to beat this. Or whatever. So it helps guide your strategy in a way. It helps guide your decisions because you know what adjustments you have to make. Uh, so we talked about in the player improvement episode that um, choosing a build order um, and getting comfortable with it was the most important thing to progressing uh, when you're new to the game. Let's let's presume that you are past the point at which you are comfortable doing build orders, um, and you can you can reliably execute pretty much any build order um, at that point. So you get to you get to a high level of play, and you can you can play any build order if you just sit down and practice it for a while. Why at that point does having a good build order matter? Uh, it's efficient, I guess. Like, if whatever strategy you want to go, whether it's timing or something like uh, what you want to defend and attack later, having a good build order means everything, your investments line up uh, efficiently and nicely to coincide either with your attack or your opponent's attack or whatever. I guess it just makes your play more efficient, is how I would say it. Even though... Um like again, as I said, it's a weird thing. Like by efficient, I mean you execute. You're in a you put yourself in a position to execute well. Not necessarily it's the best way to obtain something. For example, Huck is a player known for having awful build orders, absolutely awful. But he says he's aware of it. But when he tries to play like everyone else and just do the standard things, he plays worse. So he feels more confident when he's just doing his own YOLO things. So his well, own builds uh, are actually bad, but they make him more they make him be more efficient or whatever. It's hard to explain. No, I, I, I understand exactly what you're trying to say. So, uh Chris, okay. why would you say that having a good build order is important? Um are we saying about having having a single build order? No, no, uh not not a single build order. I mean why are good why is why are good build orders important to have? Why is it important that your build order is a good one once you get past the point at which you can execute builds in general? So I, I think I think it's different levels of optimization. Um, like I said before, I think of I think of build orders as tools. Um, and so each each time you learn a build order, that's that's a tool that specifically does something for you, gets you to a certain point uh, that allows you to execute a strategy. Um, and so when you get um, lots of different uh, builders, um, then you have a wider toolkit that allows you to kind of not only play kind of a wider variety of strategies, also to kind of lead into the same strategy through different ways. If that makes okay, sense. That is completely true, but that's not what I intended with that question. All right. So I probably phrased <laughs> my question poorly. Um, Okay, I meant I meant why is a good build order more important? Why is a good build order better better than a bad build order? Like why does it matter that your build order is efficient? As in, how do you define a good build order? Even because I, it's hard. I to think define. it's pretty straightforward. It's just it's more efficient. Like I don't right. understand. <laughs> what, 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 what do we mean by efficient when you when we use that term? For ex I think a, a perfect example is parting soul train in 2012 against people the soul trains people do now, which is something that drives me fucking insane. Parting used to have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Parting used to have plus one and three mortals at eight minutes and forty seconds, 
In Legacy of the Void, you never ever see a Soul Train that quick, ever. Everyone has a different opening that isn't Forge Expand, a different build, and they move out at the same time with two Immortals and without plus one. And people wonder why the Soul Train doesn't seem as effective anymore. It's not because Zergs have adapted to it, it's that people have abandoned the actually efficient way to do it, in my opinion. So that's a good All comparison right, so... between an efficient style and one that's less efficient. Of course, right, there are so other we'll... pros, but... Yeah. Yeah. So what we're saying here is that um, an efficient build order is a build order that gets you to your end goal, or, well, to the state at which you want to be in when your build order is mostly at that point, um, as quickly as possible. Um, so it's time efficient is what we is what we mean, I guess. Uh, um, I don't necessarily agree. As quickly as possible while not dying to an average yes. build. Well, yeah, well, yes, well, while not, while not losing. Yeah. Like, as safely getting to you need to be quickly or well accomplishing whatever object set accomplishing your set of objective criteria that you have set yourself with your strategy as quickly as possible so if your set of objective criteria is be safe against three these three different types of all-ins or attacks that my, i expect my opponent to maybe throw at me um and then get this many units and this many structures in order to do an attack at this timing um so an efficient build order will get all of that stuff in, on time and in position uh, whereas a less efficient build order might be missing a few units or a building, or it might get all that stuff a minute later, um, or it might, you know, leave open a giant gaping hole in your defense and let you die to one of those attacks you had intended to uh, protect yourself from. Okay, I I feel like that's basically just redefining the word efficient, honestly. But well, I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I get I, you. I got I, yeah, I got to ask. We, we are, we're throwing the word around, so we gotta we gotta establish what we mean by the word efficient. Okay. It's okay. defining it in a very specific way, which is fine. It's yeah. always good to be specific with definitions. Alright, I know we that's, love definitions on this show. That's the that's yep. the uh, that's the scientist <laughs> in Teo talking. Yep. Because when you're not when you're not. When you don't know what you're, you're not clear on your definitions, everyone gets a different idea of what you're trying to say with the same word. It gets confusing pretty quickly. Yes. All right. So, just um, look at how people use the word theory in science versus the general public. Oh God! Don't uh, really start theories. Yeah. But we, I'm digressing. But but Teo, the <laughs> gravity is a theory. Yeah. Calm yourself. <laughs> calm yourself. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Um, moving away from that. So. There are good and bad build orders. Um, Teo gave a very excellent example um, of the Soul Train, which was Parting's three Immortal um, plus one all-in off of the Forge Fast Expand. Um, Parting was the only player who seemed to be able to reliably hit that timing with the same number of units. No one else could really execute it as well as he could. So everyone else was hitting almost like a full minute later. Even top-end pros were hitting like a full minute later with the same unit count. Um, and it was very subtle, slight, adjustments on build timing um, and having his probe in position to put the building down just like a couple of seconds sooner here and there and like his gas timings lining up just a tiny bit better and all that stuff just tiny little tweaks like putting two works on gas and then for a moment and then adding a third worker a moment later just to make sure you got just enough gas just to get a few extra minerals early so you can start a gateway a little sooner or whatever it is you need to do um, just tiny little tweaks like that can wind up adding up to saving you a full minute on your final build and of yeah. course, as tasteless and artosis are fond of saying, StarCraft is a game of seconds. It's also a function of the opening. One thing that people don't really pay attention to, but which is a massive... It's an awesome thing when you figure it out, is that a greedy opening is the best way to transition into an all-in. Because it means that if you open greedy, you invest a lot in economy early on, meaning that economy kicks in sooner than your opponent's opening, meaning you're stronger when you're all-in. So, for example, for Parting Soul Train, he would always Nexus first without scouting because he expected to get away with it, and he usually did because of the meta game at the time. And, of course, since he was planning it all in from the start, if his all-in didn't work in whatever way, he was going to lose anyway. So, yeah, it was, just one small chink in his, it was just one small chink in his build order. But, I mean, he had good reason at that level against the players he was playing against to expect that they wouldn't all-in early. Um, especially since every Zerg back then was trying to just turtle up for Broodlord and Fester, because if you got there, you won. Exactly. Um, so he had he had good metagame reasons to take that risk in his build order, um, which is an important thing. You should know when risk is... So, hilariously enough, uh, this discussion on risk actually opened right up to where it was in the note list, on, uh, which usually is not 
<laughs> oh, we're going in order of problem this time. Usually um, we get on some sidetrack about how much everyone hates Zerg. Yep, fuck Zerg. <laughs> okay, I... Zerg's not that bad. Calm down, Teo, it's okay. No, it's I, not bad. I do have kind of uh, an anti-example for this. So, when we think, like, way back... Um, I, I don't know if anybody's done this fairly recently, but, like, I remember... One of one of the builds that Deer did when he was like on top of the world about like a year and a half ago. Um, one of the builds that he did was he opened up Phoenix in a PVZ and then transitioned into a weird two base immortal all in. And like in theory, that's not really the most efficient way to open for an immortal all in, but it ended up working excellently because it fit into his game plan. The thing well, is, his, if, his game plan was to throw people off with the Phoenix build so that they wouldn't expect an immortal while in. Yeah, efficiency isn't the only thing that counts. It's also mind games and how every other build interacts with what you're doing. Going back to the Soul Train example, the reason no one does that specific Soul Train anymore is that Forge Expand is not as good if you're doing anything else whatsoever. Because you can just do Gateway Expand or whatever. So that's it's, why it's not done anymore. You need to, your build order should be about executing, your build order is about executing your strategy as best as theoretically possible. It's about setting you up for the most possible success with your plan strategy. So while his build order, his build yeah, order what? was actually very good given the fact that his strategy was to go Phoenix then Immortal all it. Right. Um, it just so happens that if you were thinking of exclusively in the context of just an Immortal all in, then it would seem inefficient. Yeah, exactly. There are other things other than just the most efficient way to do it. You have to account for mind games, maps, mana games, player tendencies, whatever. Yep. So let's talk about build order losses and build order wins for a moment. It's a, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot, and I think it I think it tends to get misused. Yes, um, it's way overused in my opinion. And and let's talk about while we're talking about that, let's talk about risk and build orders. So start us off on that tail. Uh, a build order loss. Basically, basically the, the basic idea is no strategy, no build does not have a weak point unless it's horribly broken, like Investor Bridler. There is always something that can exploit it, usually. There it is. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> so, the whole, I guess, gambling aspect of StarCraft is picking the right strategy for your opponent, or a strategy that has either more weaknesses but also more strengths or which is more of a casual build but is less likely to be ahead against anything the concept of build order loss comes when your strategy just has no way to beat your opponents for example if you don't have detection and the other guy dt rushes that's the most obvious or, or a very very low chance of winning at any rate yeah well next to none or for example if you only make if you don't make anti-air and the other guy goes mass air for whatever reason then of course, you know, your units don't shoot up, so it's really you, hard to win. You make uh, you make only marauders, and then your marauders get ordered to kill each other when your opponent's going okay. two ban two two starport banshee. Can I bash Zerg a bit? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen I, I it was like a pro league game two or three years ago. A game where a Zerg just roach maxed against Mass Void Ray and won. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. It was amazing. That's one fighting that's because, um the product I remember, played like has, but still. I remember Mondragon beating um who was I think it was Xerax in the Z TSL yeah, that doing TSL. that. Doing that. Then again, Xerax just played bad in that series. Yeah. But I mean like it's the thing but, to remember yeah. is that just because you don't have anti air doesn't mean you lose the air. If you could just kill the other guy's base. I was like Jadong did that one time too, I remember. I hope I can find the chart for the but, Mondragon um, unit counters. Yeah. So um, an example of a build order loss that I would legitimately say is a build order loss um, would be one of my favorite bops of all time, which was Life versus Marine King Prime on Entombed Valley. That sounds entertaining. Um, Marine King Prime was very well known for a very long period of time of having only one build um, and doing the same build every single game. Well, he had two builds, actually, let me rephrase. He did one of two builds every single game, no matter what. The first build was a proxy 2-rex marine all-in. The second build was he would go 3 command center, uh, blindly with no scout as his opening, and then go into like a big bio push type, type play. 
he would do this. Every, he would do one of these two builds every single game without fail every time. Well, he did no it scout. For his whole career. Yeah, for his for his whole career for the most part. So life knew he was going to do one of those two things. So he knew a seven roach rush, which is typically a terrible build against Terran, beats both of those things. So he did a seven roach rush and blindly annihilated um, Marine King. And Marine King had no scouting information, had no way to see it coming. He's sitting there with one bunker with like three Marines in it at his natural with a third command center building in his main as seven roaches are walking into his base. And, um, and this, clarify, this was cross map. To clarify, seven roach rush isn't like your average roach link timing. That game was hardcore one base roach, which was a game that was first, a build that was first invented in the Wings of Liberty beta and then was immediately phased out because it's fucking terrible. <laughs> it, it, it's not a good build. <laughs> but like completely blindly countered him with a with a build order win in that context. There is no way to win a game in which you open three command center with no units against a seven row rush. You just you just die. Um, what what I think is that. ironic is that that was that was like at the same time that Marine King was risking stuff like that was like a total risk from life too because that that build it wasn't only. Risky. In that, that build... situation, it wasn't. Well, That's of course. The brilliance of it. But like that build only works against what Marine King was gonna do. Right. He just happened <laughs> to know for a fact Marine King was gonna do that. Right. Gaming. But um, it's that's a build order loss. That is, your build cannot in any way, shape, or form have any chance of dealing with what your opponent's doing. Um, build order losses and build order wins typically only occur when both players are taking risks. Um. And one player's risk happens to match up well against the opponent's risk. Um, it depends a seven on how you rushes... define it, in my opinion. Well, okay. Take a standard game. If you were to seven roach rush in a standard game, you that's a, a ridiculous risk, right? Yeah, but uh, I think, for example, if the pro, if you have, again, I'm using PvT because it's an easy matchup. Uh, actually, it's better to say go PvP. If you look at older games in PvP, if you... If one guy is doing like a reasonably standard, safe-ish, one base tech play with a robo, whatever, the other guy fast expands and then goes blink stalkers without a robo. One player is playing reasonably safe, the other isn't, but the other guy is already massively ahead, even though the first player didn't gamble that much. So I think yeah. you only need one player really gambling to have a build order advantage. Not necessarily a build order win, well, but I mean, a significant I mean, build that, order that, that, advantage. Right, right. A build order. I'm, I'm differentiating between a build order advantage and a build order win. Okay, fair enough. Uh, a build order advantage just means that your your build happened to match up favorably against your opponents, and you have maybe a, a bit of a lead. Not, but not that your opponent's just outright dead. Okay, right. He can still try to play from behind or outplay you or so on and so forth. A build order win is he's just dead. Yeah. Just, okay, fair enough. And and game's over, guys. He had like a he has like a five percent chance of winning from here. Like it's. Let's see his innovation. Well, oh <laughs> God, the hell that drops. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it's... So, I mean, that's an example of a build order win right there. And it, they typically only occur when one when both players are doing a risk, are, are taking a significant risk. In this case, life took a pretty heavy risk that Marine King would not send an SCV across the map or to any other build. Although, I mean, he had good metagame reason to expect that, so it made it seem less risky, but... And Marine King did his typical, I have no defense for the first, like, eight minutes of the game, and no scouting information at all, but I'm going to have so much stuff that you can't win from that point. The um, amusing and, thing and... is, no one else did that against Marine King. That's what always puzzled me. Yeah, I mean, I would have... I, I think people... Game. <laughs> yeah. When there used to be play ham dailies, I used to hope, and a few Koreans were playing in them, I used to hope to run into Marine King just to cheese the shit out of him because I could. Unfortunately, that's what never I liked, happened. But... That's what I liked doing against a Villo. But... Well, yeah, that sounds amusing as well. Uh, I used to talk to Railcoon about it. He's like, you know, you know, White Wing, you have to, anytime you run into a Villo, you are obligated to cheese him. So I'm like, all right, I'll just cheese him. <laughs> um... <laughs> But yes, so a build order loss or win gets thrown around a lot. It does not mean that your build matches up favorably against your opponent. That's just a, an advantage. Um, unless you're just flat out going to win outright just because your build happens to counter his in a ridiculous fashion. It's not a build order win. However, it should be. it must be noted that Marine King had very good reason to do that build um, on a regular basis like he did. And he won a lot of games for a long time doing it. 
because even though it was risky, as we can obviously tell for the fact that Life just flat out gig instant won the game against him with a with a with a build counter, um, nobody else was doing that against him, and it gave him a ridiculous economic advantage for a very long time. And with his micro, the, even a little bit of an advantage against Marine for for Marine King meant that he would crush you most of the time. Uh, so I I guess in that sense. Taking risks in your build order can be advantageous if you have good reason to believe that the risk will pay off. Uh, generally, they're metagame reasons. On the latter, uh, I would not advise taking significant build order risks unless you're just experimenting with the build and trying to learn it for whatever reason. Um, because you or have, your board. Or your board and just want to screw around, which is always a good time. Yeah. Uh, if you're screwing around, I highly recommend Lurkers. There's so much fun you can have with those. <laughs> um, it's especially fun when you start mixing in lurkers with burrowed banelings, not because it's good, but because it's hilarious. <laughs> oh god. Oh god, the nightmares. <laughs> especially because hold position lurkers are still a thing. Are they? That's great. Yep. You can hold That's fire great. on them. Nice. Right, in case you right. in case someone watching doesn't know because it's a brutal reference, yes. Hold position lurkers was a trick in Brood War where you would prevent your lurkers from firing as soon as a unit came into range. So you would wait, you waited until all of the bio was on top of them, and then they fired two shots and the bio instantly exploded, instead of just like shooting the first marines in the units or whatever. It was, it was called hold position lurker because you, they didn't have a stop fire button on them while they were burrowed or anything. And you couldn't, act, and they didn't actually, so you had to use hold position to get them to, to not attack for a minute. But they couldn't actually have a whole position command, so you had to group them with an overlord, and then, like, and then give a whole position command to the overlord with the lurkers in the group to get it to work. It was pretty complicated. Yeah. It wasn't. It was never something that was intended, but it worked pretty well. It it's, was it's, glorious. It's, it's, it's perfectly intended in StarCraft Two, so have fun with that. But so there's there are risks inherent in any build order. Um, Chris, do you have uh, any good examples of a um, of what you would consider to be a risky build order? Or a uh, good risk to take in a build order occasionally? Rushing DTs. Always a good <laughs> risk. <laughs> That's, that, that, is, that is a very good example. Hashtag um, book. <laughs> see, I'm trying to, th trying to think of a Zerg. But nothing's ever really risky in Zerg, I'm going to be honest. Poor Zerg. Um, like, the only think, risky think... thing that you can do as a Zerg player is not build a lot of drones early on. That's like the only thing that like becomes some risky. Some openings I... can be risky. Three hatch before pool was oftentimes quite risky against Protoss. Yeah. Uh, if you you were gambling that he was not going to cannon rush you, that's, or that he was not going to like proxy two get you. That's true. That's a very meta game thing though. As the openings yeah. for PVZ evolve, it becomes more or less risky. Right, right. Yeah. It's it's a risk. It's just a calculated one in which you are gambling that the probability of what he's uh, probability of getting countered is much lower. I I think that's that's generally a safer build than something like a fourteen fourteen opening. Like a fourteen fourteen to me seems like a very risky build uh, that may or may not do damage. I think on the whole, uh, as far as Zerg goes, uh, any build that skips drones early is going to be a lot more riskier than um, even things that are equally as greedy. I think sense. the best example is in ZVZ, the pool timings in ZVZ. The earlier, the yeah. riskier. More right right now, build order advantages in DVZ or in Legacy of the Void are almost entirely based on who builds their spawning pool slightly later than the opponent. Yeah. It's, and since you can't have your overlord across the map, it's almost entirely blind. Um, what a matchup. Yeah, it's it's it's, <laughs> it's pretty difficult right now to play ZVZ. I've, I lose a lot of ZVZs due to just bad build order matchups. Just and there's not really drone scout. about it. You just have to guess. <laughs> Kidding, don't tell uh, drone stuff. No, don't don't do that. Um <laughs> all right. So yeah, so how about how about maps? What influences should the maps have on build order? What do you mean should have? Do you mean from a map design point of view or from a player choosing the build order? I, I mean I mean you are choosing or designing a build order right now. What influence does the map have or should it have? You because you don't want to ignore it, obviously, but you theoretically could on the build order you are designing. Or... The I'd say the most important things are how easy it is to defend a base, to take a base. First and foremost, good places to attack or to defend something, generally a base. 
and also probably airspace and how favorable a map is to air units and air, air harassment. I think those are the three most important ones that I can think of right now. All right, Chris? When I look at a new map, my first thought is, can I proxy? <laughs> if not, can I do some kind of bullshit with a cliff? That's always good. Um, as fun as Terran. Siege tank <laughs> bullshit. Yeah, that's always fun too. I guess I guess even Liberators to that degree also work. 2v2s, that's hilarious, by the way, playing Zerg Terran and just doing a siege tank overlord rush to outside your opponent, like to a cliff outside your opponent's base, <laughs> right behind their main or something. That's just annoying. And then you just uh, build like then you just build a turret there for just a laugh. Mm-hmm. And then if if I can't find a good opportunity for either of those things, I usually will just kind of settle on either can I take a third base? Well, I guess I guess in Legacy of the Void you can pretty much always or you at least have to take a third base. Um and then if if you can or can't, you just all in. So, I don't know. I look for aggressive opportunities in everything that I do. And if there are no aggressive opportunities, I just kind of default back towards passive. Okay. So, um, I guess I guess the basic gist of what we're of what you guys are saying is that maps make certain strategies better or weaker. Mm -hmm. Um, and adjusting for those changes in your build order is important. Um, I would I would also say that certain build orders become completely non-viable in certain maps. Yep. Um, an example would be on the old Taldarim altar. Um. God. You in PvP. You're in breaking up. Other maps, there were other options for you apart. But other... is it okay now? Uh, Hello. I think so. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, I'm I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, Skype. On Tal... Just just yeah, blame me to Skype. Skype. Um, so in PvP on Taldry Balter, the only build you could do because of the map architecture was four gate. And the basic reason for that was is there was no ramp. There was your natural was exceedingly wide open, with an exceedingly huge ramp a good distance away from the natural to get up to it, and another path you could go around to bypass that ramp. Um, so you had no way to deny vision of the high ground or to use force fields to defend your base properly. And there was no ramp between your main and natural, so you couldn't one base defend at the ramp properly against the four gate. Uh, so the only build you could do to defend yourself against a 4-gate was a 4-gate. So if you didn't blindly 4-gate and your opponent did, you lost. So you pretty much had to buy. And if you blindly 4-gated and he didn't, you won. So everybody 4 did every single game because of the map architecture. Any other variance build was completely invalid in the matchup um, on that map in particular. There actually was um, two added hilarious levels of bullshit on Taldarim which was, with how many probes would you forgate? Because if you were forgetting with 20 probes, and a guy would, was defending with his own 23 probe forgate, you fucking lost, usually. And also, there was a defensive 3 gate that could hold a 4 gate, but couldn't put any pressure on. So that brought the tech builds back in, so it was even more bullshit than just, let's just 4 gate and whoever micros best wins. It was yeah. way worse than that. It it got it got really messy because of the it map. It got so but stupid. Yeah, it was not a it was not a good map for the matchup. But um, I just vetoed that map honestly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like you can you can look back at the really old maps that we would typically consider to be bad these days, like Zelnaga Caverns. You can't forge fast expand on Zelnaga Caverns. Um, yeah, Nani did. Expand on that. <laughs> you can't. You can't. It's just or like what was it? Metal Metalopolis. Yeah. You, you try for try forge fast expanding. The map architecture just doesn't allow for it. So I those builds, build orders just typically get Dur thrown out immediately. During the dream pool period, I saw Rain forge expanding on Metalopolis in stream, and he just defended the link all in by being a god at building placement. Okay, SimCity. That... Sim, I, I was gonna I was gonna get to SimCity in a moment, but you've led into it now. Um, an mm -hmm. important, a very important part of your build order is your building placement, and for that, you do need to know the map. And the reason why SimCity and your build order is exceedingly important is because every build has weaknesses. Um, and your building placement can compensate significantly um, for those weaknesses. Uh, one of the more common things we saw for a good long while um, with certain types of builds were Protoss players putting pylons or Zerg players putting spawning pools behind their mineral line to wall off the back of their mineral line so that units couldn't move behind it but would have to move through it or around it you know, from the other side. 
uh, by going around the hatchery or nexus. And the reason for that was because a lot of Terrans were doing Hellion runbys or doing Hellion drops. And by preventing them from running behind the mineral line, you cut off their movement pattern and made it easier to block the Hellions from get, from murdering all the drones or workers and made it easier to trap them and kill the Hellions if they actually got back there. So that was a building placement decision um, planned for in the build order um, that was to mitigate a weakness to Hellions. It's not necessarily to mitigate a weakness, I don't think, because... Those kinds of builds will, will, will basically always be the same. As a Protoss, you will always have one or two gates and a cyber core in the early game. So it's just how to... It's not necessarily how to mitigate your weakness as much as how to just defend something better. Well, I mean, that's I defending mean, something better is mitigating a weakness, isn't it? Eh, it's not necessarily that. Like, maybe your let's, build let's already... Let's define weakness. No, maybe kidding. your build already <laughs> has enough stalkers to defend Hellions, but... With good building placement, you completely destroy the Hellion drop, and you only lose, on average, I don't know, two probes a game. Without good building placement, you still defend, but maybe you lose four probes every game. Okay, so it improves your defense against something that may otherwise harm you. We can we can use that phrasing instead. Yeah. Um, and it's you have to be decisive in your building placement because sometimes because sometimes you have a choice between what to gain an advantage against defending. Um, I know uh, as Protoss, when you're doing a one gate expand, for example, sometimes you want to put your gate on the low ground or outside the natural at a at a natural ramp or something, and sometimes you want to put it inside the main at your main ramp, depending on what you're planning on defending against. Um, if you're tr planning on dealing with, if you're going Nexus first thing and you're worried about a um, like a one base ling rush or something, putting the gate at the ramp in your main. Um, so that you can quickly wall that off and then sacrifice the natural to the Ling Rush and then be even because a Ling Rush is a huge investment from Zerg. Um, is oftentimes a better decision for that defense than putting it on the low ground. But on the other hand, if you put it on the low ground, you are more likely to defend against later Ling timings because you can have a wall of the natural and then you don't lose your expansion. Yep. That's what I have. Um. <laughs> Terrans, Terrans don't have to worry about that because they can um, build their barracks at their natu uh, in their in their main base at the ramp, and then float it down to the low ground if they need to to make wall. Or they can put it on the Maybe. low ground and then float it back into their main if they need to because flying well, Terrans, buildings are amazing. Terrans wall with depots and bunkers. Yeah, I mean you have all that too. That's um, just how the race. Functions. I'm I'm gonna be honest. Other than ZVZ, I feel like Zerg doesn't really worry about building placement all that much. ZVT against Hellions. They they really yeah, Zergs really that's should worry about their building still. placement more. Um, there are a lot of Zerg there are a lot of advantages Zerg players could get from better building placement that they typically just don't bother with, and they really should. Um, yeah, well, I'm not gonna say anything this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, the the main reason Terrans don't usually wall off with barracks, even though they could, is because um, it's spawn dependent, so it's hard to plan for that in your build order. Because if you spawn on the left side of the map, um, your add-ons will be outside your base and easily snipeable. But if you spawn on the right side of the map, your add-ons will be in your base and easily defendable. So it, Terran players don't usually plan on a barracks wall um, unless the add-on unless they're not putting add-ons on them. Well, yeah, and I, I mean even even the uh, the barracks is potentially at risk of getting sniped. I mean, less less so now, but like when you think back to like the four gate days and things like that, if it's, you put it if you put it next to your wall, it's it's in danger there. There was and you can defend just as well. I by usually got the spikes instead because they were you know just yeah. as lethal. But there was a pretty <laughs> sad game Jinro played in GSL when he was spawning on Belshir Beach, which was a map without a main ramp, and he was top left, so his addons were towards the opponent. And he was going one base reactor Hellion, which is, was the standard build at the time. And he couldn't do it because Lynx kept sniping his reactor. It was a very <laughs> sad game. Yeah. It was such Beautiful. a it, 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 Yeah, so Terrans don't usually try don't usually rely too much on building walls with um with the main production buildings. Not because they're necessarily at risk of dying, because they have a ton of health and they can be repaired, but just your add-ons get sniped. Yep. Um Okay, so maps obviously matter quite a bit. Um, the map architecture determines, in large part, where your building should go. Uh, so you do need a plan for that in your build order. Um, and that's and it's important to make sure you know where they're going ahead of time in your build order. Uh, and it should be considered part of it, even though it's not on the list of 
the denotation uh, supply count stuff and everything to where the buildings go. Uh, you should plan for that in advance. And typically you want to know where they're going because your worker needs to be there when it's time for the building to go down and not in your mineral line and then get sent out because that can cost you quite a few seconds. Yeah, especially if you're trying to hide things by placing them at the edge of your base. Yeah, if, it, if it's going to take you 10 seconds for your worker to get to the location to build the building, send the worker 10 seconds early. Don't don't wait till you have the money, then send it. Um, that That is very often a difference between winning and losing a game if you do that repeatedly. At a high level. Uh, not even not even necessarily at a high level. I've lost track of times I've seen players that I was coaching or just assisting in whatever reason at like silver and gold were doing like a DT rush or something. Um, and their DTs would be like three seconds late in avoiding detection. Hmm. Um, yeah. Because of stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's just to execute. So that's a big part of it. Um, We've already talked a fair bit about executing your build properly, but I guess we can we can focus on that for a minute. Um, any tips you want to give people, Chris, for proper execution of a build order? Um, tips. Uh, I think the the way that I always practiced build orders was I just kind of went into a custom game against the computer and just played through it, you know, two, three, five times in a row, just making sure that. Uh, my money stays low, and then I'm always constantly producing everything so that there's no gaps in production ever. And if you just kind of practice that kind of mentality of uh, just trying to get everything mechanically perfect, the build orders will flow a lot more smoothly. All right. Tail? I think for execution... Um, it's important to not overly focus on a build order. So, for example, uh, if you say you always you feel like you always lose to a mine drop, the solution is not to look for a build that does not that crushes mine drops because there isn't one. Every reasonable build is okay against them, but it's just to practice against specific things if you feel like a specific thing is holding you back. So, for example, during Wings of Liberty. One of my biggest weaknesses in PVT was holding a one get expand against two racks. So I just grabbed a practice partner and played 20 games of that. And then I didn't lose two, two racks ever again. And every time I saw someone two racks me, I was happy because it was a free win. And for the record, the counter to two racks was sending a stock route to your opponent's base and then kiting them backwards. No, I meant two, two racks reactor tech lab. Oh, oh. oh yeah, that, that's, a, that's always how I dealt with that. I just sent stalker down, saw it coming, poked him a bit, ran away, and it was just like force fielded. I uh, can't do that against concussive shells. Like in some situations. Oh, you meant with... the concussive shell rush. Okay. Yeah. yeah that so one's a. They went... Yeah, that one had to be very careful. The one that hit with like six, mar... no, five marines or seven, seven marines, two marauders with concussive shells and like three or four SCVs right before warp gate was done when your nexus was almost complete. That was a hard, actually a hard build to hold on some maps like Zelnaga Caverns. Yeah. Well, I mean, Zelnaga Caverns was a really, was all the maps back then were really small. So yeah, stuff like but that was if you really had a good. proper one get expand, you just crushed it and won. Yeah, you just one get expand. Yeah, get but you need a lot of fun. Yeah, you need a, like build. a specific execution and shit to do with the one get expand. It wasn't just ah, oh, one get expand always holds. It didn't if you yeah. didn't do it properly and if you didn't practice. Right. Okay. So, um, let's talk about changing your build on the fly, um, and scouting and reactions with a build order. So. When you're doing a build, if it's a good build, you will typically have several variations planned based on what you expect your based on things you might expect your opponent to do or um, on what you might see when you scout them. And if you don't, then what? Then don't bother scouting. If you have like no variation planned whatsoever, don't don't bother that, scouting. But, um, um, there's something to be said about that, which is on the one hand that makes sense if you are used to that, but if you aren't. Even if you're not going to vary it in your build, it is comforting, I should say, to actually scout something because, you know, okay, he's attacking me now. You're going to be in better position usually. You will pay more attention and whatnot. So it's not as simple as if you're not going to change, don't scout. It's if you're not going to change okay. and you can pay attention to everything your opponent can throw at you, which is a big deal for lower league players, okay. then so, don't scout. So a player who is notorious for playing with very low APM um, and, and see if you guys can figure out who this is as I go along here. Uh, exceedingly low APM. Uh, Whitewing? 
White Wing? Who? Joe. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> Teo has the answer already. Um, would never scout no matter what, and he did manage to actually defeat the best Zerg player in the world in a tournament, um, despite having exceedingly low APM and not scouting at all, because he knew he just wasn't going to adjust his build based on anything he saw, because he knew his build was a safe catch-all open against anything a Zerg could do in, in, at those timings. So he trusted his build enough to know that he could deal with almost that he could deal with almost anything um on the other hand it is oftentimes very wise for your build to incorporate scout timings in which you are looking for certain things that might be problematic and then having a planned response to those um so a, a, a really cheeky all-in i did for a good long while in heart of the swarm which a lot of games when i back when i played protoss only was to actually do a three gate stalker void ray all-in but what I what I would actually do was I would put one gate in my main and only have one gateway in my main, and on one corner of the map I would proxy a stargate, and on the other corner of the map I would proxy two gateways. And then they would inevitably scout my main, see that I was missing buildings, and then they'd go looking, and they'd find either the stargate or the gateways. And if they found the gateways, I would make a um, oracle and kill all their workers because they were not expecting an oracle to fly in. Um, they were expecting a gateway bust, like a three-gate attack or some sort. And if they scouted the Stargate, I would build a Void Ray and do a three-gate Stalker Void Ray all-in. Because they'd be not expecting all the gateway units. Um, that was like the dumbest cheese ever. <laughs> I think Chris beat me with that in our grudge match when we played in one of the maps. I don't remember. I remember some bullshit with Void Rays in one of the games. Yeah, I think it was oh. just a, that was just the fastest possible proxy Void Ray on Belshir. Oh, okay. <laughs> You might have been. Uh, there's there's some there's other common adjustments. Um, you used to see players like um, uh, who am I thinking of? Uh, Innovation would used to like cut marines. Um, if he if he saw um extra, um, if he would see extra pr uh, greed on the part of his opponent, he'd cut marines and um and throw down extra tech faster, um and throw down an extra expansion quicker because of the marine cut being cut. So they'd have fewer units for a while. But if he saw that his opponent was not um, was not being super greedy, he would play times. So he would just make the extra units, um, and adjustments like that to deal with um, with possible attacks, or like um, making an adjustment whereby you see your opponent has an early gas as Zerg, so you throw down a tech lab and make a single siege tank, um, which it was not originally planned, but just as the planned adjustment you have in case of early gas, just so that you can be safe against roach busts or baneling all ins or something of that nature, um, is is the sort of very simple, not too difficult adjustment you can make to, to deal with a difficult problem. But they typically require that you have it planned for in your build order and your scout timings. Um, and for, for that reason, scout timings are a very important part of build orders, apart from the like actual mineral cost yeah. of the scout. One thing to be said about that is that there is, in a lot of situations, no way you will be able to hit every scout timings and, ac and account for everything your opponent can throw at you with an adjustment, which is why there is such thing as a build order loss, because StarCraft is inherently a game of incomplete information. So you should have some adjustments, but you shouldn't um, over-obsess over having adjustments to absolutely everything, because that right. is just not possible. Pick, pick the things that you consider to be most problematic or most damaging to your strategy. And, and just accept the fact that sometimes you will have a build order disadvantage. Um, but a dis build order disadvantage is perfectly acceptable. I mean, you can play from behind and you can win games from behind. It's, it's a little bit more difficult than winning from ahead, but it's not by any means unplayable, especially if you're good. Um, and as, as a matter of fact, the build order advantages become even less significant as players um, decrease in skill, um, absolutely speaking. Yeah, and everyone who isn't Korean is bad at StarCraft anyway, so... <sighs> oh, that that hurts, man. All right, little bow, little bow made BlizzCon, even if he didn't practice for it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. St St Stefano, if he came back to StarCraft, would totally just win everything again, and you know it. Come on. He, no. he still is a no. StarCraft player. He doesn't play in tournaments anymore, really. He yeah. wouldn't win shit. <laughs> the the Kaspuk Koreans would 
destroy him. All right, all right, you you can't let me have like the okay, okay, it's it's fine, guys. When Thorzane, our Lord and Savior, returns, he will. Crush <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna have Thor The Lord of the, the the Lord of the Plus Two Armor Thor all in. <laughs> that was solid though. That fucking build. <laughs> <laughs> like it was so ridiculous. Blizzard nerfed it like the day after he won against Noni. No, no, no. The, the day after he won against MC with him. Oh, MC. Okay. It was, oh, yeah, right. twice. He beat Noni and okay. then he beat MC after. And then oh, yeah, right. the next day. I can picture Blizzard being like, okay, Noni, fine. Okay, Noni's a foreigner, but beating fucking MC, no, this is bullshit. <laughs> Foreign this, foreigners can't be this has Koreans? To go. No. If, if, they hadn't has nerfed, to go. if they hadn't nerfed it, it would have been included in the Great Book of Protoss bullshit just for posterity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is how you bullshit as a Protoss. You pick Terran as your race, and then you go plus two <laughs> armor. <laughs> or all. Um, no, but I mean, just in general, um, having planned adjustments for things that you consider to be damaging is a very wise decision, um, and is a important part of good build orders. Um, in, in general, I would say that unless you're doing some sort of metagame, wonky metagame thing, or you know something's going to happen, or you highly suspect something in particular is going to happen, and therefore plan a counter to it, um, good build orders, especially on ladder, tend to be ones that are good against it, or at least acceptable against a wide variety of things and are fairly general. Um, yeah. So having, having a few different alternatives planned um, or a few separate deviations that maybe slow you down a little bit, but you know, deal with whatever your opponent's doing um, is, is the hallmark of a good build order. Of an, yeah, of a good ladder build order. Yeah. But, yeah. All right. So, Let's go on to how we pick our own build orders um, and when you should be focused on creating or modifying your own build order or when you should copy a pro's build order. I think that is subjective, depends on the player and also on what you have to do. Personally, for my, I guess, average standard builds, I would always use pros, pro builds or ideas from pros things that were reasonably close to what they did. For my completely bullshit things, I would come up with things. So for instance, if I had a clan war and I knew who I was going to play and I had to snipe them, I would have obscene shit planned. <laughs> like, I used to... I remember <laughs> a game against a teammate. Uh, we had two teams and, well, we had three different teams in my clan. And in once in a clan war, we were playing against each other. And this guy was the cheesiest cunt fuck zerg ever. The first, the very first game. Yeah, so, sorry. The very All right, first we're gonna have to edit that out. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like the very first game we played against each other, with right after we joined the team, he went ten pool speed into two base foremost against me. So I just rage quit. <laughs> I get wrecked. <laughs> yeah, it was. Ladies and gentlemen, this is this is why Teo hates zerg. No, no, I hate it. We, we narrowed it down. Anyway, so I knew I was gonna play him in a series, in a best of three, which was the most glorious best of three I've ever played. In the first game, I was going to DT rush him, but he just, temples, he just went temple speed against me, so I died. The second game, I forgot. The third game was like a two base Ling Hydra all in against Man Train into Soul Train. This all to say- Man Train into Soul Train? Yeah, like I faked that Man Train, kept making probes, recalled, and then made two more Immortals and I moved again. Against him going to base Ling Hydra. This all to say that we planned the shit out of that series because it was amusing. Reminds me of this time uh, when against uh, Chris here, esports John, uh, I uh, opened up with a certain three blinks, a three three <laughs> gate, uh, three stalker rush against Zer his Zerg into three gate sentry push into immortal Archon charge rod all in, and he crushed the first two handily. <laughs> and should have had thoroughly won, and then I caught him in his hydralis transition and just murdered him. It was strange. I was not expecting it. Nope. Because normal people don't go fucking Archon Immortal charge on it. No one does that. <laughs> Another glorious snipe build we prepared was against a Zerg who we knew used only one army hotkey, like all the time. Like he would just use the F2 thing, he didn't even group his units. So we prepared a two base charge zealot war prism mass DT all in, and it worked. Yep, I mean this is 
There's times. all sorts. Of, if, you, if you're gonna, if you, so in general, if you're just looking to have fun, just do whatever build order you feel like doing. Just yeah. do your shit together. You don't need a pro one to copy. Um, but for, I think for, for standard builds, it's better to start off with a pro's build, and then maybe you can make your own modifications to it if you don't like something or if you find that the pro's build is too hard to execute for you, you can make it safer or whatever. Yep. Um, if you're gonna copy a standard build from a pro. You should probably watch them ladder on, or stream a ladder session or get some ladder VODs from them because um, those will be the, the standard builds that are fairly reasonable and safe to use on ladder. Um, or like get VODs from them playing a, like an open bracket tournament, like an MLG or something. Um, yeah, so tournaments are really good because they yeah. always release replays really quickly. Yep. Uh, but um, doing copying a pro build from like a GSL or Pro League Probably is not a good ladder build because those builds are very meta specific based on the uh, based on the specific opponent they plan for, um, and both players are trying to meta game each other on those maps. Uh, th those builds are not going to be reliable, safe ladder builds to copy. I mean, it depends, but it's easy. I think it's reasonably easy to spot the meta game ones and the non meta game ones. But if it's uh, something that's really weird, that's really out there, it's more likely to be a prepared build. If something looks I mean, like a standard build, then it's fine to copy it, even if though it's from GSL or Pro League. I mean, some of those builds have like very small like timing adjustments that if you just copy the numbers yeah. exactly, you won't have any understanding of why they're doing it. Um, yeah, I agree. That's why one thing I recommend when you learn a new build is to not look at only one replay, but look at multiple ones. So, for example, when I write my guides, I'll look at... I'll find specific players that I know use a build a lot. I'll go through their match history on TLPD, and then I'll watch every game they've played, and I will note adjustments and opponents and tendencies and things like that. And then you can really figure out exactly how a build order works, rather than just copying from a single replay. Yeah, and if you're gonna make your own build order, um, a really good way to do it is to get a be to get benchmark ideas for timings from pro builds. Um, and then modify the build that exists for your own needs if it can be modified. Um, and if you're just trying to do something that's completely out there, um, at that point, when you've gotten to the level at which you can make your own build orders and figure out how to execute them and know why you're doing certain things, you, at that point, um, you should start looking into build order optimizers and generators, um, which typically work by specifying an endpoint. And then they tell you the timings at which to do things in order to get the, the build there as quickly as possible. And then you can make adjustments and then so on and so forth and figure out the build from there. Uh, and those those tools are typically made by community members and you can find them if you look enough. Um, I'll see if I can find one uh, in a few minutes to post in the chat here. Uh, but they, they're typically fairly useful for creating your own builds in that way. Um, so yeah, uh, just if you're doing something, if you're trying to do a standard build, um, unless you're, until you're a pro player, uh, I would suggest not trying to create your own. And just copying, but if you're just trying to do whatever you want or just have fun or um, you're trying to metagame someone specifically, at that point, creating your own becomes a quite a reasonable thing to do. Yeah. Just if you come up with your own standard build, just don't think you reinvented the wheel because it's really unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, it, I doesn't found... it doesn't happen as much anymore, but a few years ago, you would see posts of people in like Gold League claiming they solved the matchup, which, nope. Yeah, fortunately, we don't see those very much anymore. Yeah. Uh, th that was rather amusing for a while. And someone just like, here's how you solve the magic, guys. You do six hydralisk rush on one base. <laughs> yes. P ZVP is solved forever, guys. Like, it's... <laughs> I remember, uh, if you guys remember KCDC's thread when we discussed how to beat Stefano's Roach Max. On the older oh, maps. Oh God, I remember. I remember some of that silly stuff that came out in he those threads. Specifically, he specifically said, "We need to find something that is flexible." You can and half the posts were like, "Just go double roll by mortal. It always works against roaches." Right? Yeah, uh, but it's and, and bad like, against but, everything else. <laughs> but the Zerg always follows up the Roach Max with a Muta switch. Yeah, like always. That was the build. That was the Dong Ray Goo build. Yeah. Um, well, sometimes, yeah. like, if they did that, they would win. If they just all in with roaches, they lost. Yeah. Period. Like, <laughs> uh, 
there's some brutal stuff in that regard. But all right. So I posted the link to the tool, uh, which you can find on Team Liquid. Uh, for those people who are watching the VOD and are not in the chat right now, um, it's SC Fusion. Um, it includes the latest version includes Legacy of the Void support, um, and you can thank Carbon Twelve for the um, for the software. Um, so this is a, a build order optimizer that you can use for creating your own build orders and giving you helping you out with that. So if you you plan on doing that at some point, definitely look into it. Um, the build order optimizer does not tell you adjustments you should make for safety. Sometimes in a build order, it is a good idea to be a little bit slower with your build to account for certain options or to do things in a less than optimal speed order to be to be a little bit safer. This tool will not tell you that. So you need some context. But it can it can give you a good idea of what benchmarks can look like um, to, to help you figure your and iron your build out. All right, then. So it, it's time now. Let's discuss as, as much as we know, and we have to give this disclaimer that the game is brand spanking new. There hasn't been a lot of time to figure it out in the current version of it. Um, and we've only had one, like, what is it, two days of a tournament so far to, like, actually get Dean builds and a couple of days of streaming since it was released. Let's talk about Legacy of the Void build orders. Expand all the time. All right, so let, let's start with the matchup that I know for a fact Teo actually knows something about here. Let's Yay. start with the, the, best, the best mirror matchup, PvP. Yes. And PvP has historically been the worst or, like, second worst. But in Legacy of the Void right now, I actually feel like it's probably the best matchup right now in the, for the mirrors at any rate. Um, so right now, it seems like the safest way to open PvP, hilariously enough, is a Nexus first. <laughs> um, yeah, so <laughs> the way that works is because everything it's really hard to just scout and react, and Warpgate is really slow in the first place. So it's really easy for the for the Nexus first to kick in by the time you can actually have a warp gate timing going. So yeah, either fast expand with adept pressure or Nexus first seems the opening to go. Yep, like a one gate expand is perfectly viable and completely safe against pretty much anything they can do to you. Nexus first is quite safe against most things. It's a little risky because if they like two gate proxy zell at you or something, you still die to that, but or like like three gate adept proxy or something like that, you still probably die to that. But I think the best response could be going two gate chrono adapts and expand behind it. Maybe even double expand behind yeah, it. I, like if the person who went Nexus first like micros and controls properly and has decent like Sim City, um, with their Nexus first, which we discussed. Like you want to have your pylon, like a pylon out like in good position around your Nexus to around your natural Nexus or your main Nexus to defend your workers, etc. And if they do something like that, you can just pull your workers into the main for the moment or whatever, if you need to. Um, just having good control and micro and positioning on your buildings for your ne for your first Nexus cannon. Because you get Nexus cannon as soon as the Mothership, well, not Nexus, uh, Pylon cannon, I guess, when the Mothership core pops. Um, you, you actually can like wind up easily going even against that type of pressure. Yeah, but I think um, that pressure still gets, I imagine at least, I haven't done it personally, that, pres that pressure probably still gets you map control. So you can oh, it does. It, it, it gets Nexus first, it one. does. And maybe, like, if you kill three workers and you get map control, maybe you can even get away with a double expand behind it or something. Or even just a single expand with more probes being made because you're currently boosting your Nexus. But but right now in PvP, the, the best ways to open right now are either a Nexus first or a one-gate expand, pretty much hands down. Into uh, it, It's actually really amusing because warp gate offensively is so bad right now um, because of the, like, the ridiculously long warp in times. PvP has got is the only matchup in which Protoss is actually advised to tech early. Um, for the most part. Do <clears throat> how quickly do oracles come out now with the tech compared to things like warp get and stalker counts? Because on one paper base, oracles one base yeah. oracle rush? Yeah, like uh, one base oracle into an expand or something. Because on paper that could be a good way to deal with a really quick expansion. Uh, but not it necessarily. Typically... It typically does not get there in time before the mothership cores out, hmm. um, unless you proxy it and are like really fast and like cut workers to get it out there as quickly as possible. Um, it, it typically the mothership core is out in time to do to drop a pylon cannon. Um, okay. Usually, just like run the workers away or something. It doesn't. It, it doesn't. It's usually not worth it. It doesn't do enough damage um, against a one gate expand at all. It might do it against a nexus first. 
Um, but because one gate expand holds it quite reliably, there's people just don't do it. I see. Um, maybe you can on on two player maps. Maybe you can do it reactively against the nexus first. That could be an interesting thing. Yep. All right. So that's that's the basic gist of PvP. Let's do the other mirrors. So Chris, ZVZ time. Uh, Let's talk Zerg. To be honest, I haven't seen a lot of it, but yeah, from what I from what I know, it's uh, it's all just based on who puts down their spawning pool last. And it's just yeah, but, it's but, but, no, but not much later because if you put it much, much later, later, you still die. Right. So it's it's just like it's a it's a very difficult balancing act because you really have no idea what your opponent's doing because you can't scout early enough. Yeah. So you just kind of have to err for kind of like a safe-ish build, but like just greedy enough. I found that hatch first is still pretty safe in ZVZ, based on my I think, experiences. I think hatch um, first is pretty viable in in all the matchups. Yeah, so. in, in in ZVZ it's quite reasonable because. Even though they get, I mean, both of you have a 12-worker start, and I guess he could just 12-pool you, but you can you can usually have enough income, even with a hatch first, to get your pool down on time, and just microing drones can can hold it off long enough. Right. It's not, it's not um, as scary as a 6-pool, for sure. Yeah, against a hatch first. So, um, I, I feel like hatch first is pretty reliable in DVZ right now. Um, you can you can do some wonky, like, bane link, like, really fast bane link all-ins that deal with it, but... ZVZ, every build is entirely blind um, in that regard because your scouting is your overlord getting there and they're much lower relative to the build uh, timings than they were in uh, Heart of the Swarm. So you you pretty much just kind of have to guess and hope it works. There's, we're going to need some more time to really figure out like what's the safest way or most reliable way to do ZVZ. But my guess, it's, it's a very volatile matchup for the time being. Yep, As usual, um, it's, it's very easy for ZVZ to be volatile when you don't know exactly how openings line up and how to get away with things and defend and whatnot. Yep. So, yeah. So, that's pretty much the um, the main gist of um, ZVZ. It's, 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 there's no set optimal way to build. It's pretty random. Um, I, would, I would say that if you want to save build, practice hatch first into pool without gas, or or maybe even an early gas as the pool's building or something. Um, up to you, but it's... Hatch first seems like it's probably, on average, pretty safe. I'd agree with that. Alright, so TVT time, the last mirror. TVT is not as bad as EVZ right now, in the sense of how random it is, but it's it's pretty wonky right now, because tank evacs are pretty ridiculous in TVT. If you are not making tanks with medevac support and your opponent is, you're not dealing with his tanks at all. You, you, your opponent will be making siege tanks, using medevacs to reposition them constantly to push tank lines forward exceedingly fast. Because he can just pick up the tank, move it a little bit forward, and drop it without having to unsiege, walk forward, and resiege. So, And if he gets caught out of position, he can easily just retreat with all of his tanks without losing them. So TVT is pretty much all about the siege tank with the medevacs now. Uh, you can deal with it, and because it's almost entirely about the siege tanks, it is of course, and medevacs, it is of course about the Viking and the Banshee as well. So pretty much the best way to open TVT seems to be a one-one-one, um, or a one rax expand into super fast starport. Um, those are those are pretty much the only ways to play TVT right now. So... Reaper rushes are pretty dead. <laughs> I guess Reapers don't get there in time. There's too many Marines or whatever. Yeah, they, they don't. Or so it, it's not the... just that. It's, Reapers don't get there in time for scouting information so, okay. or anything, really. And so yeah, the Marines one shut one them down one... easily. Okay, so the 111 tech kicks in in time to do stuff against like a 1 Rex expander or CC first in that specific matchup? Um, it's it's because if you one, it's because if you're part of 1 Rex expand, you do a 111. You actually have the tanks and medevacs and like Hellions or whatever else you're building or Banshee. Um, like okay. fast enough that um, that you can easily even it out and have just have a tech lead. Okay. Yeah, that's what that's what I was asking. So it does kick in in time, not like PvP and Stargate, like we talked about before. I yeah, don't really yeah. know about it, PvT, so. Yeah, in, in that particular situation, um, it's pretty heavily about the tech in TVT. Um, bio, until they do, if unless they change something about the way the tech medevac uh, mix works, bio is probably going to be playable in the matchup on most maps. 
Um, I can envision a map that is so exceedingly bad for mech that you need to play bio on it, or bio tank. Uh, but for the time being, you should pretty much probably be playing mech strategies or, or marine tank strategies. That's... Okay, so marine tank is still a thing. It's just pure bio that isn't. Yeah, pure bio is okay. pretty dead. Um, the problem is, like, you can't catch tanks anymore out of position. You can't yeah, flank them. I can't imagine. Because because if he's paying attention, he just lifts his tanks and runs away with the medevac speed boost. Um, so uh -huh. it's it's just not you can't flank tank players out of positions if they're paying attention. Um, but yeah, it's. I feel like right now most common is is probably actually just the bio tank, the marine tank. One thing we didn't discuss about PvP is the mid game, which is I think the most interesting thing about the matchup because it's so changed. Stalker disruptor. Yeah, exactly. I think watching it is really cool because it's really micro intensive and really tense. It's, it's probably really stressful. All, it's probably incredibly stressful to play. Yeah. Uh, it's so stressful to play that. But yeah, PvP right now mid game is mostly blink disruptor. Um. And all right, so let's let's. Uh, one Let's more, talk what? about the. Okay. Okay. Go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Now, go ahead. Keep one going. thing that Keep interests going. me about um, blink disruptor is people will have to figure out exactly when to go disruptor because if you do it too soon, then the stalkers just blink in and one shot your disruptor. If you do it too late, then you have a bad maxed army or you have like an inefficient army if you stick to pure blink stalker for too long. So that will be, I think, an interesting evolution in the matchup. Yep. I was watching Mana stream. Um, for like all day on Thursday and yesterday as well. Um, for anyone who hasn't watched the stream, go check out Liquid Mana. It's a good stream. He's he's he he could use the viewers. He's a good guy. He's got he's he's doing a lot of streaming right now. In fact, yeah, he's streaming right now. So. <laughs> not not at all biased to whatsoever. <laughs> but uh, Mana, go check Man out. Um, and he was doing uh in PvP. He was doing a lot of like he was doing stuff but he was delaying his disruptors a bit and just putting pressure on after doing the the, the one gate expand openings that he was doing um into just microing his stalkers well and whenever his opponent went disruptor too soon he would just blink directly on top of the disruptor and blow it up before it could fire or detonate the orb because of course the weakness of the disruptor is even though it does a ton of damage and is really powerful it can't move while the ball is out and if it dies while the ball is out the ball doesn't go off so you can actually just kill a disruptor by jumping on top of it before it can blow and kill anything. Um, so yeah, it's it's just, it's it's mostly a question in that regard of making sure that you have enough defense to get your disruptors, and you're very careful not to let them blink on top of it and things like that. It's a very difficult matchup to play right now. It's very very micro based. Um, I guess it's always been micro based, but it's more stressful than it has been in a long time. Um, so ZVT, what do we know about ZVT? Fuck or ultras. TVZ. That's that's uh, all I've been, all I know about CVT is what Iagus says. So, <laughs> so all all Which balance is... all balance discussions aside, um, because I think I think it's probably if it's not it's... well known now that the game is not currently balanced in a zero incarnation, I think it's perfectly reasonable for um everyone to expect that it's not very well balanced right now upon release. Um, so all all balance issues aside, um, uh, and Teo is itching to say certain things. <laughs> Um, right now for Zerg, if you can get to Ultralisks with an acceptable amount of upgrades, like, that should be your game plan against Terran. Because Terran cannot deal with Ultralisks without, without, like, Ghosts or Liberators, because Bio units just fail super hard at killing Ultras. Like, the only thing units that can kill Ultras are Thors, Liberators, and Ghosts. Um, and no Terran is making Thors, um, unless you have a huge mute account. Don't, throw, uh, don't Ultras also kill Thors reasonably efficiently? Uh, no, not really. Um, Thor, a Thor beats an Ultra 1v1, um, and with a Thor with other bio units like and stuff getting in the way, the Thor will, Thors tear Ultras pretty, apart pretty quickly. Oh, huh, okay. Um, the Thors do, Thors do all... Thor is actually the highest single-target DPS unit in the game with their base attack, um, mm -hmm. by far. It's, it's actually not even close. Um, Thor's do a crap ton of damage single target. The reason why Thor's seem kind of bad usually is because most units don't have enough health for their damage output to matter. Like, Thor's yeah. do so much overkill. That's um, ridiculous. But, uh, like, it's... Liberators seem to be better against um, all, dealing with Ultralisks because they also shut down Mutas even harder than Thor does. Um, I guess it's hard to transition into having a good Liberator account, though. I'm not sure. Yep. 
but so right, I imagine right now it being an issue because that's always the Terran issue when they have a late game counter, a supposed counter. It's hard to get to it because of how the race works. Yeah. Lurkers don't seem... Lurkers have uses in the matchup, but they seem like they're less effective here than they are against in the other two matchup. Um, lurkers mm -hmm. are actually quite good in ZVZ if you can manage to get to the mid game and, and get them out. And they're very good against Protoss. Um, but the reliability of scan um, just seems to indicate that lurkers are... And, and like the high range of siege tanks. Um, it, even though siege tanks don't really show up too much in the matchup, but um, just Bio being able to micro against the Lurkers, along with the power of Liberators, if they manage to come out, um, typically shuts Lurkers down without too much trouble. Yeah, I feel like they could probably be in ZVT a bit of a situational unit, like uh, a situational thing, I should say, like Burrowed Banelings, where a bunch of Burrowed Lurkers, Burrowed Hold Position Lurkers, can shred a Bio Ball, but it's going to be very hard to make that work consistently. Yep, so ZVT builds right now are basically opening with a, with a hatch expand, like hatch first every game, um, into sort of like a speedling type build while you're droning, just to just to do your typical scouting thing, deal with the Hellions, make a few extra queens, because queens are great. Um, I, Taya wants to say something, but... Uh, <laughs> and after, um, and get your third hatch, get your third base up nice and reasonably safely, and just get ultras out as soon as you can. Um, mutas are perfectly viable. In fact, two base muta has made a bit of a comeback. Um, it's it's quite reasonable to to do that now because of the the way the timings work and everything. And mutas come out a bit sooner. I don't actually know that it's good and that it will remain good, <laughs> but it's being done right now. Um, so it it's hard to say if it actually is good or not because the game is so new. I'm gonna be honest with you. If if it's if it's the evolution of Zerg build orders, the ultimate like goal is going to be more queens and more bases it probably so it's not going to stay <laughs> it probably it probably will be but um ravagers That's... right now are not very useful um early on against terran um just because their units are so mobile the ravagers never hit anything and they're kind of expensive for in terms of their without their ability being useful uh so it's lurkers are good early on for defense if you need them but Typically, you don't have them out in time for the really early pressure stuff. So right now, it's Zerg is you basically just kind of play it as you always have, um, and just try to get ultras out quickly. Um, and because your ultra lists are so strong now that they can't. And Marauders kind of got nerfed too, so um, ultra lists are just outra outrageously strong right now. So you can get the ultras; you're usually in good shape as Zerg. For on the Terran side of things, um, you pretty much just want to keep Zerg pressured and stop them from getting to ultra lists. Because he's going to get there sooner than you're going to get a high enough liberator count to shut them down, or or like be able to afford a lot of ghosts or anything. I, um, I have a quick question. Have you seen a lot of, or have you seen much Roach Ravager against Terran? I've seen a little bit of it. I don't think it's very good. Okay. Um, every Terran player I've seen play against it usually shuts it down with just a, a more Marauder heavy composition. Okay. Um, Roaches Roaches still have the same problem they've always had. And in terms of, like, outright damage output, um, Hydralists are actually just better than Ravagers for cost. Okay. Um, it's it's just that Ravagers have that special ability, but against Bio, it doesn't really hit anything. The special ability is pretty solid against Liberators once Liberators are out, because you can go around, skirt around it, and then just, like, drop it on the Liberator, and they can't, like, unseat and mm -hmm. run away all that easily. Um, right. Roach Ravager is more of a thing against Protoss. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, from what I've seen, like in uh, PvZ, basically everything just revolves around uh, when the first Roach Ravager push is going to come around. Yeah, it's, um, Roach Ravager is a pretty powerful thing in that matchup. Like I, I typically see, from what I've seen from different streams and things like that, is like usually the three bases are taken very quickly as a standard in PvZ. Um, and there's there's various different gas timings some some of them are at uh 2 30 some of them are a little bit later um and it all comes down to like when the first rich ravager comes out and then protoss kind of either it's like a deflection of protoss pressure or it's meant to put a lot of pressure back on the protoss to keep them from uh easily taking their third and then from there it just kind of seems to go into whatever but the real the real big thing is that is that particular timing yeah, so, um, let, let, uh, so just, just just finalize a little bit more on the TVZ stuff before we jump right into PBC. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, One that's thing... fine. Don't, I know you want to talk about that, but um, the um, 
Okay, what is a tail? Go ahead. One thing about ZVT is, as you said, Terran is kind of on a timer to kill Zerg before Ultras. What I wonder is, is there a mech timing that can do that, or are you forced into bio? From what I think you've it's, seen, I, th I think it's map dependent. Um, the problem is, is because if Zerg feels like he needs it, he can make mutas, um, and mutas are still really strong. Okay, and that especially since two days, time. especially since especially since two base muta is a thing right now, still, Terran can't really safely do an, a mech opening because you could run run into two base muta and just die. Hmm. I see. Um, it's it, it, it not it's not fun to try that. Uh, mech is not really a, a thing right now on its own. Um, it might be. It could be. It might wind up being maps that are good for it, and things might change. People might figure. Um, the problem is that the cyclone is not very useful early on um, against Zerg because yeah, bottle speed lanes. I... So. And it's just it's it's really all the how that goes in that regard. And I guess right, so. if you go cyclone to defend the two base mutas, then you don't do anything else. So yeah, you you, you wind up defending the two base mutas, and then have it. Well, if you do defend the two base muta and you went two days muta, you're actually ahead because two base muta is a huge investment. But yeah, but it's not realistic. Like the other guy can probably just poke your front, see a cyclone, and double expand, and don't and not make mutas, right? Or make less right. mutas. So. Yep, among other things. So I would I would not rely on that necessarily. Uh, Widow mines are still good. Bio mine still works. Um, a modified bio mine timing, just like you used to do with Heart of the Swarm, guys, it still works just fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Just be careful to not to not like run into whole position workers or something. Um, yeah. Ravens seem like a better call than they've ever been before in the matchup to have early, not because their spells are necessarily good. But because um, the, of the new of the way creep works now, how it spreads faster but recedes faster, so the fact that it spreads faster means it will be across the map a lot sooner and giving the Zerg and more control. So you really you really need to be killing it off a lot more rapidly. Um, and that sort of implies that you don't want to be dumping huge amounts of scans into doing it on a regular basis. But it, it, at least it recedes faster. So after you clear some, uh, you have uh, you have a lot less time before you can still like dive you. The creep start actually f like spread faster. Uh, it creep creep after you place a creep tumor, the creep grows out faster. But if you kill the creep tumor, it recedes faster. It okay. recedes. But really I, I'm just I'm just saying like does does the creep spread across the map actually go any faster? Uh, it, if they have more queens, yeah. Um, it's it's okay. right now it's so fast it's mostly limited only by the creep tumor cooldown. It used to be that when you'd place a creep tumor. The creep tumor would come off cooldown um, before the creep had finished growing mm -hmm. fully from that tumor. So you could like place it next and before, it went, or you could have waited a moment, let it grow a little more, and then place it. Now it grows so quickly that um, that you're pretty much limited only by the creep tumor cooldowns. Which means okay. if you have an extra queen or two spreading creep, it actually does spread a fair bit quicker. Yeah, yeah, that makes um, sense. So that, that's pretty much how that goes. Um, so PVZ. PVZ. Um, Zerg again wants to open with some. Wants to, typically wants to open with a hatch first um, into a quick third. Uh, two hatch before pool is quite viable and very safe right now, because um, forged expands into in for cannon rushes are not really a thing. Um, they might be if three hatch becomes very common. But... I don't think it's good enough because forge expand delays your warp gate by so much. Like yeah. when and also I remember. I remember trying it to test it when the beta was released, and I comp I got my warp gate when my main was starting to mine out. Like it was that slow. Yeah, it's it's. It was not... like five minutes, five plus minutes. Yeah, right now so... in ZVP, feel free to just double hatch before pool. Like the only thing they can really do about it is like a proxy two gate, like like or three gate adept rush or something. Um, and it it's watching players like Stefano stream. You can actually just kill adepts with Zer with speed legs if your control is decent, and you like fight, pick the right places to fight them. Like yeah. adepts are supposed to crush zerglings; they actually don't for cost if if you control the links properly. Um, I'm not surprised. So, so, yeah, don't don't <laughs> don't feel too bad about just staying on speed link right after. Did you say that queens are good against them too? Well, yes, queens absolutely <laughs> are good against that. That's not what are queens not good against? High templar <laughs> ghosts? Anything else? <laughs> Thors. <laughs> Thors, yeah. <laughs> That's they're, true. They're, they're not very good against siege tanks or Thors. Mm. On a one to one ratio, they're not great against Phoenixes. On a one to one ratio, I think they are great against Phoenixes. They actually, they actually do very well against Phoenixes one to one. 
Uh, especially if they I mean, have I mean transfuse. technically like, technically they can do neither they can do neither. Just like, all the phoenixes come six, in and lift. Like six queens destroy six phoenixes. I think. Yeah. They, oh they yeah, do. yeah. For sure. You can um, try to fight it. Alright, so apart from that, um on the proto side of things, um a Nexus first is pretty reasonable. Uh, they won't have speed and time because of how fast the Nexus comes down versus how slow their gas is at the start. Um yeah, those timings are really interesting. I don't know how they work out even with just like a mass slowing all in of sixteen drones. You can because you can because it, your Nexus cannon your your Froton cannon is available immediately as soon as the mothership core pops, uh, Nexus first is pretty safe. Um, you can you can Nexus first. You can also do a one gate expand pretty reliably. Uh, one gate expand is preferable if you want to put a little bit earlier pressure with adepts, um, especially given the way adept ghosts are great for scouting. Um, I think one gate expand might actually be slightly better, but um, Nexus first is quite viable. Uh, so e so either one of those openings is decent. Um, Protoss is in a tough place in the matchup because Zerg can do can make whatever units they want and it works against Protoss. Um, which means yeah. you have to be scouting for everything. Whereas Terran, sort of, there are certain things Terran really doesn't have to be too concerned about in general. Um, like Ravagers, for example, are not generally too useful against Terran. Almost anything you make against Protoss is going to work as Zerg. Um, uh, so well, you, you really do have to just be. I think a huge factor of that vigilant. is also is also like like I was saying, going back to the Roach Ravager thing. It's a lot. It is a lot like uh, Heart of the Swarm PVZ in the in the sense that. You can kind of just make these units and just have map control, and behind that, it's really hard for Protoss to get a a good read or force certain tech choices out of the uh, right. Zerg player. As as Zerg, sense. you want to time your build so that you're hitting a timing when Protoss tries to take a third. Mm -hmm. um, Protoss does not like to do tech builds in the match. Um, as, as it stands right now in the current state of things, if Protoss does a a greedy a greedy econ build and just tries to do everything they can as quickly as possible in the most greedy fashion possible and zerg does not attack and just does whatever they're doing even playing a little bit safe on the safer side just to make sure they don't die zerg still comes out ahead in that protoss needs to be putting pressure on zerg in order to, to have a chance in the matchup uh zerg's opening is zerg's safe opening like three hatch before pool are so powerful that there's not, and the way the drone and uh, larva inject work, there's nothing Protoss can do economically to keep up without putting pressure on the Zerg. So because of that, the only tech build that seems to be viable from Protoss that is not an all-in, so you, if you're doing a robo build, you pretty much have to all-in. Um, not necessarily. The um, uh, At least, uh, I'm not sure. One of the few interesting builds I've seen, which I think... I still think they're, they have weaknesses, but they seem reasonable, is what Morrow does, which is he opens, like, War Prism Adept against Zerg, just for... Sometimes it's either harassment with a third behind it, and if he plays the same guy multiple times, he will also mix in a 7-gate Adept all-in with the War Prism, and that seems okay. It doesn't seem fantastic, but it seems like it's a reasonable set of things you can do. Yeah, um, it's, I mean... But you don't have to. I mean, like, I mean, I mean if you're doing like, the, like I meant if you're seems... doing like a, a uh, like a one gate expand into Robo immediately. Yeah, that's that's uh, what he's doing. He's yeah. doing like, uh, I don't I don't remember if it's like Nexus first or one gate expand, but he fast expands, gets four adepts and a zealot just to wall off, gets a war prism and three gates, tries to do some pressure, takes a third behind it, and then goes blink stalker disruptor. Something oh, like yeah, that. that's, that's great, as long as it incorporates some form of pressure. And, like, Warp Prism Adept right now is like tends to be the best kind of pressure. Yeah, if you he does that, it. and then sometimes instead of taking the third, he just gets four extra gates and all-ins with it. Yeah, um, that, I, I would agree. You need to have Adept Warp Prism pressure early on t seems to be reliably the best way to put pressure on a Zerg. Um, because of the, you can warp in the extra Zealot if you need to. The Warp Prism warp is, like, the only way to warp in units quickly, aggressively, other than... Um, Literally building a warp gate out to their base. Um, so, yeah, that, that's probably the, one of the best ways to open. Um, as long as you're doing a warp prism thing. Um, so if you're not doing the warp prism, though, if you're, like, baking immortals or something, you pretty much need to all in with that early on, because otherwise a mutual transition will murder you horribly. Um, 
And and Zerg really has the ball in their park on this one. They can just react to anything and just do a tech switch whenever appropriate and just kill off anything. Workers are very strong versus Protoss if you can snipe observers, which is not too hard. Um, but because mostly because Protoss does not build Colossus after the Colossus nerfs, they're not a cost efficient early on in the game. So the only things that Protoss has that reasonably outranges the lurkers um, is a disruptor, which is iffy. I mean, it can work. You need to, it takes a while before they're out. Or um, Tempest, which are obviously not going to be on the field for quite some time. Can you rush carriers like you, people were trying early in the beta? Or is it not viable? You, they nerf the because carrier a bit. Rush. Yeah. Um, again, so it's That's... really not worth doing. And you usually die trying it anyway. Okay. Um, yeah. So it, it's... Protoss really wants to put pressure on Zerg and slow the Zerg down and take a third behind their pressure. So take a third while pressuring. Um, or just all in the, the Zerg. Um, Zerg has such an econ lead that you kind of have to do something to slow them down aggressively. Add a pressure with a Warp Prism is really solid. You can also do an Oracle opening after your expansion. Um, Oracles can be good, um, especially if you make fortune to make like six Spore Crawlers, it's probably worth it. Uh, no one makes six Spores against an Oracle, though. Some people do. I, Sue does every game. Mm, against a single oracle? Yeah, he'll do six spores. Oh. Because uh, good, good, good players, even good players with a single spore will still bleed drones throughout the course of the game if they don't. I, I think um, I'd rather make like four, though. Like maybe two on the third and one in the main, depending on what the map looks like. Oh, I mean, it's it's iffy. if he, if he makes four yeah. spores and you get a couple, if he only makes four spores and you get a few kills, an oracle still worth it, especially because revelation is super good now. Yeah, that's true. It's or revelation of the oracle is so good, and stasis trap, if you use it correctly, um, and you're very careful with it, can be the difference between living and dying, and in winning a game you shouldn't win, or winning a game handily. Stasis trap is not the best spell because it's not too terrible, terribly hard to deal with if your opponent's vigilant. But just the act of having the Oracle and threatening Stasis Trap can make them play a lot safer and a lot less aggressive. Um, or it can, or you can actually just hit a good Stasis Trap and just shut down their stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, Oracle openers are reasonable, but I would not recommend straight Phoenix openers anymore. Um, yeah, I don't think they're worth it because they're incredibly expensive. Phoenixes, like currently with the economy, massing Phoenixes takes longer than it takes Desert to just mass units and drones compared to Heart of the Swarm. So it's just really hard to make them pay off. You need to do more damage than in Swarm. So don't go six Phoenixes after Stargate. Make an Oracle. It's better. Clearly, we should do the rain build and go two Stargate, like 12 Phoenix Rush. Um, <laughs> and, then, and, then just, and then just all in with like only Phoenixes. <laughs> Lift all the queens and just kill them all. Uh, or just fall into their base and murder only overlords. <laughs> it's just all of them. I used um, to do that in Wings of Liberty. I would go like one base double Stargate Phoenix before the ra the build time buff. Yeah. And then so it's, either you kill every Overlord, the Zerg rage quits, or you die. Yeah, I don't I don't want to say that Zerg is Imba right now because it's not obvious that they are. We might just need time to figure stuff out. But with the current builds that seem to exist and the current way things work out, um, Protoss definitely has an obligation to be aggressive. So um, can I say it? If you don't want to say it, I mean you're gonna say it no matter what. So. <laughs> Yeah, Zerg is OP as hell. But um, <laughs> I, Protoss has the obligation to be aggressive in the matchup. If you're not aggressive, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, Blink Stalker stuff is still good, by the way. Uh, although the plus two Blink Stalker all in is not so good because getting plus two is not quick or easy yeah. anymore. Rel relative to the game state at any rate. All right, so final matchup, PVT. PVT seems weird from what I've seen and from what I've been told. Because Terran actually has a very strong max now. So it's almost yeah. like Protoss has to be more active. Like Protoss the, does have to be more active than ever. The matchup has almost reversed from where it was in Heart of the Swarm. In that Protoss with Blink, with Blink Stalker, with Disruptors, has a stronger mid game than Terran does. Um, and can and needs to do a lot of damage in the mid game. It should be like it needs to like control the full battle, and maybe attack a bit, or and do some harass, some solid harass with warp prism shenanigans with adepts. And the power of adept in the mid game army is not to be understated. So Protoss like adept disruptor stalker stuff, um, seems very strong in the mid game. 
Uh, but late game, Terran actually just murders Protoss straight up because Liberators are very hard for Protoss to deal with without Tempests. And even with Tempests, like some PDDs well-placed or um, just like strong control in general with Vikings or just like good placement can, can deal with that without too much trouble. Um, especially since you're doing like Bio Liberator. <laughs> and you don't want to make like a Wampus against like Bio until you have like Colossus, etc. The main difficulty and the main reason why Terran has a huge advantage is that microing a lot of disruptors is very difficult. Yeah, microing a few is is quite manageable, but once you get up to like five or six disruptors, like controlling more than that is just making more disruptors. After that point, just becomes a question of replacing ones that are dying rather than like using more. What I have seen from streams is that players actually micro them like their brood war units, as in they actually t use them individually instead of mass. Having yep. them mass massly grouped in yeah, another you, you control group, you stagger so, the uh, you stagger the shots. Uh, so having to do that is very mechanically difficult if you've never done that before. It's really really hard. Yeah, it, disruptors right now um, are mostly about having one so that one fires um, and then it detonates and then you fire the next one while the first one backs off, and you just try to control the map with them and just like try to pressure your opponent and try to kill units where you can. And you basically fire them in chain so that your opponent can't close, so you kind of use it as a zoning tool, sort of. Um, but once you get up to like, I don't know, you, you kind of treat it a Colossi where you make just like a few and you don't make like 20. Um, the highest I've seen, I think, is like 10 in PvP. Yeah. That's PvP, though. Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen more than 10 at once. Um, Probably less in PvT, even. Yeah, it's sure. they're they're really strong in the mid game. Very strong unit in the mid game. Terran has a tough time unless they're like a freaking god of micro, of splitting and like medevac pickup nonsense. Um, so right right now where, it seems like that's where Blink comes in though. Yeah, you, you, so there's you pretty much energy there. You, you pretty much need Blink, um, adepts and uh and disruptors in the mid game against Terran. Later later on you add you use a lot more zealots than adepts, but um. And early, you can use more Zealous than Adams if you want to, because of Marauders or whatever. But Terran seems to want to just open, like, a, a safe expand build. Um, and then, actually, Terran just kind of wants to just defend and kind of turtle on a few base on three bases until they get, like, a decent Liberator count and then do, like, a giant push of death with, like, buy a Liberator. It's it's very hard to stop his Protoss once Liberators are out. Yep. Um, so that, that seems to be the sort of, like, optimal build path of Terran in the matchup at the moment. Um, I don't know that it'll remain that way. Maybe Protoss will figure a way to shut down the Disruptor, or the Liberators, rather. Maybe Terran, or use Disruptors better. Maybe Terran will figure something else out. But it seems like they both want to open with, like, a one racks one gate expand, or Command Center versus Nexus first, or something like that, into uh, a, a reasonably timed third base, where Protoss needs to be the aggressor in the mid-game, and just try to, like harass the Terran a lot. I forgot, uh, uh, oh yeah, one, what I was thinking is, I think the one thing that has potential maybe to deal with Liberators is Storm Flanks. Because Liberators are very mobile once they're set up. So if you can get a few good Storm Flanks, maybe you can soften them enough for your Blink Suckers to clean them up. I mean, I mean, it's it's theoretically possible. You need a few Storms. Um, yeah, per it's, they don't usually stack directly on top of each other to avoid stuff like that. But, I mean, it is it is later on if the game goes that late. The Protoss might have the tools to deal with it. Uh, Tempest certainly seem viable for that. It's just... Games don't usually get that far. Once the number of Liberators are out, Protoss usually dies pretty quickly. <laughs> um, Yay. It, it might just be a matter of figure, if Protoss players figuring out what to do about it. Because the game is very, very new. So th yeah. I'm not, I don't want to complain about balance at all. Um, yeah, I mean, we used to think that once Terran was maxed on Marauders, he couldn't be beaten as Protoss in 2010, at least. So, you know, times change. Right. All right, Chris, you have anything to say about PPT? Not really. You, I haven't you've been very quiet for a while. Yeah, no, I, I honestly haven't um, experienced much PPT, so I, I don't really have a lot of input there. He's been watching no, Blizzard streams. Yeah. 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 How the mighty have fallen. Sorry, we can't. We can't all be Protoss gods, Teo. You keep disappointing me, Chris. <laughs> okay. All right. So we would love to cover the the matchups in a lot more detail with like very specific build orders again that are very solid. The game is a little, little bit too new for that right now. We will be Jeremy 
uh, who is Jer99 uh, on the Teal Strat, is heading up a project to get like some really good solid builders out, which we are planish, planning on publishing on Team Liquid as soon as we can. Um, we're working on getting the like the the race guide um, pages back up and there's just discussion threads um, up as soon as possible for Legacy of the Void. So look forward to the to the build orders and stuff we get going in there. Um, uh, we, tr we try to cover it as best as we can right now, but there's just there's not really that much data available yet on what's really reliable. Um, at at present, based on what I've seen so far, if I had to pick a weak a strong race at the moment, it would be Zerg. Um, but it's really too soon to tell. All right. Uh, any final words on build orders, guys? Uh, and if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to ask them now. Uh, I don't in the chat. have anything to add. So yeah, questions time, I guess. Chris, do you have anything to add? No, that's pretty much pretty much everything I can think of to talk about for build all right, orders. All right. So while we're waiting for any questions that might come through, uh, Teo, what is your favorite build order ever? Two base Templar PVT. Hands down. Temp. All right. Mm -hmm. That's pretty fun. That was a pretty fun one. Too bad widow mines are a thing, right? Yeah, I did that <laughs> since uh, about early 2012 until the widow mine change. So when the widow mine change got through, it basically destroyed my PVT because I could not do Colossus first. <laughs> all right, uh, Chris, your favorite build of all time? Proxy Oracle and a four gate in PVT. Yes. Okay, you, you're getting some points back. The you're best getting, film. You're getting some points back, Chris. Good choice. Like when you execute that and it works, it just feels wonderful. My, I think, I think my favorite build of all time, like in just how silly it is, is probably Moon's Baneling Landmine Rush, <laughs> um, where he like literally rushed a bunch of Banelings with Burrow and then did nothing with them except stick them or stick them around a key point of the map and wait for his opponent to walk over them. Like, he just rushed it. Just the silliest thing I've ever seen, and he won a lot of games doing that, too. Gotta believe. Alright, so we have a question here. Colossus. Uh, will Toss ever use Colossus in Legacy of the Void? Um, they certainly won't open it. I do think the Colossus has a place a little bit later on in time when you have a bit more money, um, and you're not in, in danger of dying immediately, and you just want more damage in your army. But it's sort of the slow, vulnerable unit that um, doesn't offer as much value as it used to. So it's it's kind of like a late game, like finalizing your army composition type deal that you just kind of add in because it's because you want something different than what you already have, rather than something that you adding because it's good, amazingly, particularly great or amazing. Um, I they're nice to have. They're not nice to have to build. I think it they might also be very situational because in late game. Threats to Protoss seem to be more air-based, like Liberators, Vipers, and Mutas to a certain extent. Broods, maybe. Um, they, the only one that isn't air-based, that's a big late-game unit, I guess, is Ultras, but Colossus were always bad against Ultras. So they might be good in specific situation against specific unit comps, but overall, I think they will be much, much more situational than ever. Maybe in PvP is where you want them. I don't know. You really don't want them in PvP because Disruptors annihilate them. Mm, yeah, fair enough. Like, disruptors well, crush Colossus. Yeah, I guess... Because they, can they, can't, they can't run the away. Shots, they can't yeah. escape or dodge the shots at all. They just die. Um, yeah, but I don't know. Maybe in a maxed engagement, if the choice is either blow up all the Stalkers and force them to blink or blow up the Colossus, the better choice is to force the blink and go for the Stalkers, and then the Colossus can be useful. I don't know. I'm just uh, I suspect I'm not saying that's the case. Yeah. I suspect it'll probably be blowing up the clauses. I think I think clauses best use will probably be against Zerg late game. Um but Yeah, it's... that seems reasonable. But even then I think it's going to be situational. It'll obviously be good against Brood Wars to clear out the um the brood wings. If you're so still not, on ground, so you're not blowing up but yeah. If you are on Sky Dust Templar, then you don't want Colossus against Brood Lords. You would rather have Archons, I think, on the ground. God toss is never gonna happen. Stop trying to make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Cake sauce asked, "What is the very best option from the book of Protoss bullshit that he can abuse for easy wins?" All of them. Faceless builds. So the build orders don't match up anymore because of the economy changes, but the spirit of the builds lives on. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
don't so DT rush. Don't DT rush anymore. It doesn't work. Don't just don't do it. <laughs> See, the mineral income at the start of the game is so much higher than gas. Overall, mineral sure. income is much higher than gas income now because of the twelve worker start. Um, and it, people tend to have more minerals overall than gas. Gas is a little more delayed. So affording detection is much easier than it was before. However, however. The way the, the spirit of the tasteless build isn't in, in PvZ isn't to DT rush, is to distract your opponent from your DT rush with another thing. That maybe that still works, I don't know. So if you do like Clearly. a timing <laughs> with DTs behind it. Clearly for me, I think the most bullshit thing you can do against against Zerg, and it's a little map specific, but it's still hilarious, is to do like a Tempest rush. Yeah. And, and just get behind their mineral lines and a laugh hysterically on da- because they don't on have a dash and terminal. Yeah. Just do it in dash and terminal. Well, I mean that yeah. map's gone, but Oh, is it? Okay. Pretty sure it is. Uh, I don't know. I heard there. I, I might just. I, heard, I might just have it vetoed still if it's still in the pool. But I'm pretty sure. I it's... heard horror stories about the ladder pool, so I assume Dash and Terminal would be in it. Ladder maps. One v one ladder maps. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was every... Yeah, all the... it's all Blizzard maps now. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I haven't played maps. on it obviously, so it either still had it vetoed or it was removed. But I was pretty sure it was removed. Yeah, right, it's so. Done. Um, do I think Legacy of the Void is harder for new players than the previous expansions? Yes. Um, the game is much quicker. You have to be doing a lot more things faster, and you have less time to think because you have to be expanding constantly, and the economy boost quicker, so you have less time to think at the start of a game. Um, and there's a lot more abilities and different unit interactions to control because there are more units in the game. So it is objectively harder than Heart of the Swarm was. Um, but it's important to remember that really the difficulty of the game is based on how hard difficult the opponent you're playing against is as to whether you win or lose rather than the game itself. So I because the, so, I'm sorry, the, go ahead. The, the latter adjustments seem like they're probably going to do a good job at matching you against people of approximately your skill level. So the fact that the game itself is mechanically difficult is not a reason why you should necessarily lose on ladder a lot or so on and so forth. Um, and the, the basic gist of how you get better with the game hasn't changed in any way, and you can see the episode we did on improvement for the basic gist of how to do that. Um, so while it is literally, objectively a harder game mechanically, I, I don't think it, it's gotten difficult in any way that actually matters. I think it's harder also because um, it's harder to play back-to-back games because there's more action, there's more things to do, so you just get tired more easily. And so that's you why you take a break this. to do some. And that's why you take a break to stretch and do some push-ups yep. in between games. You need to take more breaks and do more push-ups. <laughs> I think there was a, there was a thread on Team Liquid a while ago about um, like getting ripped by playing StarCraft, where every time you lost or won a game, based on how you won or lost the game, you would have to do an exercise before your next game. Um, yeah, there was one was with, where stuff. you got. Yeah, there was one that was like that when you got Russians in Dota games, which is always. And depending on how the <laughs> Russians behaved, you would have to do different exercises. And like, on that get note, flamed in Ru- like get flamed in Russian do ten push-ups, something like that. There were a bunch <laughs> of things. All right. So um, on that note, I think we've pretty much covered everything. There don't seem to be any more uh, questions at the moment. Um, so thanks for coming, everyone. Um, we'll see you in probably two weeks um, with another see topic. You. So, um, bye. All right, peace out.